All right, so welcome. And I know it's convention time, so lots of people had emailed me already saying that they were going to be uh, on the road, totally understandable. So you can obviously watch this at a, at a different time. So we are on session four, hard to believe that we're already on the second last. We have another one in April and that will take us right through to June. And then we're pretty much done with unpacking our, uh, our year for the first time through. So second time through will always be faster and better and there won't be as much bridging because your students will already have gone through one year of the program. So this won't be, it'll always be a little bit different for the next two or three years for sure. So what I'd like to do today is as we kind of said in our last video that when we come back now, sort of into the February, March, April, we're going to be targeting the learner outcome as stated in the documents because we've done most of, not completely all, but most of the bridging and so now we're really re revisiting every outcome that you've been talking about with students, but with a whole new focus of the end number in mind or the end goal in mind so that you're going to be assessing them on for the final report. So it's the same outcomes, only it's a different target. So this time what I'd like to do is maybe just also talk a little bit about some of the geometry and measurement pieces because we haven't done a lot. Um, transformations come into play now. Um, grade ones would have been working on symmetry. So they would have in theory come to you this year with symmetry and they're already in their back pockets. Again, well, there's some things that we have to bridge, but um, those are the pieces that started to come into our year at a glance. So I want to talk a little bit about that. I want to talk a little bit about maybe some activities that we could be doing now that would allow you to revisit, but then it would look fresh and new to the students, even though it's the same outcome, same visit, just a new target is really what we're doing. So we're looking at those types of pieces for uh, this particular session. Let's begin with our acknowledgement. In the spirit of reconciliation, we want to acknowledge that this gathering is taking place on traditional lands across the province of Alberta, home to many diverse First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. We acknowledge that this land is a traditional meeting ground, giving voice to its original peoples and the story of creation of this country in a way that history has forgotten. So as we've done in the past, we're going to kind of revisit where are we at in the year at a glance. Remember that you do have flexibility. You didn't have to be right on with this thing or, or following it in its entirety. We still see that there are some numbers in here because we had originally had those numbers quite a bit higher and then they got adjusted because people found it was too fast to move the students into. Some of you may have students who are well into uh, approaching a thousand already. But now you're really sliding into the achievement of the 1000, right? That's our goal, what you're going to be assessing them on. So every revisit we have now is just with a higher number, maybe to 600, 700, then to 800, 900, whatever you're working on. Um, same thing, students analyze quantities to 1000. So they've been analyzing, they should be totally masterful at 100 because once I can master the 100 analysis, analyzing 200, 300, 400 becomes the same routine. But if I don't have the 100 really well established, then I'm going to struggle with any number that comes after that in any case. So that's why we said mastery of that 100 is going to be really important. And we had start regrouping here. We actually started it in the end of January already. We, we did talk about it there because a number of people were already doing it then. But if not, it would be a good time for us to start moving into that. We still have half a year. We're not finished by any stretch of the imagination. So starting to regroup, money would be the greatest place for us to show them regrouping before we even bring out base 10 blocks so that they can see why they are regrouping anything. And then we can slide them into uh, base 10 blocks, which are abstract. Don't walk around with those in my pocket, those types of things. Uh, and we'll do some examples of that as well. Also talking about patterning, and again, many of you started patterning right at the beginning of the year and infused it as you went along, which is totally fine. Uh, but this is our revisit in February to come back to it. Maybe now we're using different numbers. Maybe I'm working, instead of working to uh, 200, now I'm working at 800 and I can set up some patterns 
in numbers. And so they're still working on learning their numbers, but I can set up patterning through that so that they're also practicing the fact that they have different types of cores that they can see. I'm increasing by, by two, skip counting by two, skip counting by fives, by tens, whatever, okay, fifties. Um, duration is your focus. So time periods from beginning to end, what's the duration that goes in between um, the amount of time that's elapsed in between those the pieces of time. Time was an ongoing. We said that we would keep that going all year. We also have measurement coming into play here and length is in particular, talking about the unit of length um, and that they're quantifying that measurement, right? So we want to look at this. This is not new. It had originally come up once before. Some of you had mentioned that you were going to not do it until February. So this might be the first time that you're seeing it. But again, we want to make sure that they understand what units of measure mean. Like, what is that all about? What's the difference between a number path and a number line? So that they understand the importance of the, the number zero. Why is zero on a number line, but not on a number path? Um, and that all helps to, to build in. Estimating. Can they estimate approximately how long something might be? Can they use their hand as a referent, their finger as a referent, their body as a referent to measure something that's in the classroom? So again, it's that estimation piece. I know approximately how tall I am. So when I go and stand against a counter and I'm slightly taller than the counter, I can get a guess at about how high that counter is. And then they can measure it to, to double check it. We also have geometry. They analyze and explain geometric attributes. So again, this is not necessarily something new because some of you did the shapes with your patterning at the same time, but we're looking at shape as being an attribute. We're looking at all the different angles can be an attribute. Um, depends on what you're gonna use. If you're using your base 10 blocks, those could be set up by angles, number of sides, color, whatever attribute you want them to do or multiple attributes. So when we look at March and April, I'm still seeing those same outcomes. You'll see the same ones are, are showing up. It's just because we're, we're revisiting, right? You keep moving towards that thousand, giving me new experiences, new activities, maybe revisiting an activity that we did in October for a smaller number. Now you bring it in for a bigger number, just trying to keep the whole process fresh for them. They don't need to know that they're revisiting. They just think it's some new approach, new activity that they're gonna learn and it could be. But it's also a, a revisit to strengthen and master um, their ability to handle. So we're going to 500 and on, and that's kind of your slide into the thousand, right? You're, that's what you're going to be assessing them on in June. So we're still seeing the 1.3, 1.4, 2.1, 2.2. All of those are still there. Um, they just get refined. Practice, practice, practice. And the more that you can show them different ways to do this, especially with the regrouping, so that they don't just see an algorithm and they don't just see base 10 blocks. Better, could they start with money? Do all the questions with money first. Let them do the work with the money. Let them actually manipulate the money. Have that place value conversation about the money with the two digit numbers that they're working on. And then we can start to bring the, the algorithms or the symbolic work side by side. We can also have um, counters. We could use Cuisinair rods. Cuisinair rods in a DASI track are great to show how we're gonna add numbers together. Um, so if there's no rush to get to that symbolic right off the bat, they need to really have a good strong foundation. Um, working with a grade two class right now. And so we've just been working on uh, double digit numbers. We've been adding double digit numbers to single digit numbers with no regrouping and with regrouping. So they are working with $10 bills and loonies in, in their entirety. And we work on that and they become very, very proficient at, I have more than 10 loonies, I need to trade those for a $10 bill. So they can quickly add two digit numbers. So as we proceed now, we're now gonna start to bring in the symbolic so that they're doing the work at the same time and that they can see it. And after we start getting a little bit of work on that, then we're gonna start to introduce um, Cuisinair rods and have both the money, the Cuisinair rods, the symbolic happening. And then we're going to bring in the number line and just have all of those happening at the same place so that a child who feels more comfortable with one can go to that one. There's no one right way to do it. In the end, yes, we want those symbolic pieces to be kind of our finishing place. 
that there's absolutely no rush at this time of the year to be at that point only and, and to worry about it. So we'll look at some of those as well. So looking again, March and April, we still see that time is the ongoing, so we won't uh, talk too, too much about that. But remember that duration can also be reflected to the clock. They don't have to look or know how to tell time, but they do need to know that elapsed time, how does that happen on a clock? Even if it's a digital clock, how do they know that time has elapsed? What are the indicators that they would look for? That's what they should be able to explain to us, that they know that time has gone on. So that would be that duration piece. Um, let's see, and transformations. So we want to also look at the properties of what happens in a transformation. What are the things that change in a transformation? So does the orientation always change in every transformation or does the orientation stay the same in all transformations? Or is it a little bit of both depending on which one I did? So again, we want them to be able to experience and see all of those. And we are at a point, we'll revisit this one in our last session. I'll bring along, along a couple of activities that you could do if you haven't already done something with stats. Uh, statistics is sort of being introduced in that April timeframe, could even be May and June. You could have done something in science and social studies already. It doesn't have to be done in the math. It's a very nice thing to do in social studies or, or tied into science. So there's lots of ways that I can bring data in, but I'll bring some ideas along in case you're looking for some other ones that you just want to em employ in there. Okay, so when I talk about um, quantities to a thousand and we're looking at how do students make sense of the number a thousand? We've talked about, you know, they have to be able to skip count. They have to be able to skip count by 50s. They have to be able to skip count by 100s, count to 100. They should be able to start at any number between zero and 1,000, depending on where they're at in their learning and, and move on from there, know something about the numbers that came before that. So they have to have a sense of what 1,000 actually looks like. So one of the newer templates, they're posted on the Moving Forward website in the grade two section. Remember at the bottom, you can always download any of the resources there in the math kit area. Uh, we created this one to work solely on base 10. So what I'm seeing here is I see the, the loony, the $10 bill, the $100 bill, and then you also will find a template in there for the $1,000 bills. I have written under here, not for legal tender. So the $1,000 bill has now been re removed from circulation. But it, I think it was important, first of all, to help students connect to 1,000 to see it. And if we're gonna talk about money, then what do I do with 10 $100 bills? Well, I would make 1,000. So just so that they have a sense that $1,000 bills actually did exist at one time, we actually took them, I created a template for you there. I think there's eight on a page. So if you wanted to introduce them with your money in the classroom, just photocopy them, cut them up. And then you've got at least a couple of them that they can see. But just so that they're actually making the exchanges and the trades and the conversions of 10 $100 bills could be converted for a thousand. Remember when we did try to clarify this early in the year, we had asked Alberta Education about how we, how exactly are we supposed to handle the, the place value of a four digit number when we're only supposed to go to 1000. And remember that the reply was that you are to go beyond 1000 when we're talking about place value, that they understand what is in each of those place uh, places where number takes each of those positions and the value of that but you can't do that if you're just gonna to go to one zero zero zero, like that's just not gonna happen. So they said, absolutely, you would go beyond that. So to me, that made it even more important to have that thousand dollar bill so that I could create a number like, you know, could you show me $1,274, right? So just giving them the number first, like even calling out a number like that, if they're at that point, and can they show that number anywhere on this, on this sheet would be great. We don't necessarily have to have columns. It could just be words on the top of your screen, on your smart board. You could use your money app that we've shown you many times where you can just drag the, the bills out. And in actual fact, this is what we did with students in grade uh, one. Actually, we did in grade one, but we didn't have the thousand on there. They have a smaller template. But we also do a lot of this with grade twos. And we first started it with just giving them 
a bin where they would go in and grab a whole handful of things. And the only things that were in the bins were loonies, $10 bills and $100 bills. And all we asked them to do was just sort them, sort them into the right place here. And then do you have any that have a need to be traded? So do you, did you have any of your pile in here that had more than 10, 10 or more? And if so, then what would you trade for? So when I first introduced this to students, I actually do the app on the board. They don't even have the template. They haven't got the money in front of them yet. I just go to the board. I project my own columns. I just say ones, tens, hundreds. That's all I put on there. And I don't even drag a $100 bill out. I just mm -hmm. randomly with my finger grab a whole bunch of $10 bills and just pull them out into the screen and a whole bunch of loonies. And then I just ask your students to come out and say, is there anybody that could see that there's something here that we need to trade, that we, we've got way too much of something and we could make it a little bit more efficient and smaller? And so usually hands are up. Okay, well, come and circle. Show me the, the numbers that you're going to circle. So usually they know to start with the loonies. They'll come up, they'll circle 10 loonies. And what we do is just to make it simple, once they've circled their 10, they put an X through it with their smart board marker. And then they take their finger, that's the part they love, and they drag out a $10 bill and add it to the $10 pile. And then once we've done all the loonies that we can do, then they go through and do the same thing with the tens. Are there any tens that we can trade? So initially I deliberately make sure that there's always way more than 10 of everything on their screen that they can work from. But that was our starting point for the addition of two digit numbers as well. So can they master just the connection between, I've got too many loonies, I'm going to trade them, I'm going to move them for $10 bills so that when I say to you, can you show me $32, they will show me on their desk three tens and two loonies because they're not working with loonies, just loonies, base 10 system. And then I say below that, show me $24. So then they'll show me two $10 bills and four loonies. And then the question is, how much money do we have all together? So there's my addition of a two digit number, no regrouping. And they, this is a, a group, the one group that I'm working with, there's a lot of, of very low uh, students in the class, they're struggling. Um, and they've become extremely quick at being able to put it together. But part of that is because they can see it, right? I think that's the important piece that we need to just recognize is they can see how many $10 bills there are. What's in the tens column? I can count up those $10 bills. What's in the ones column? I can count all of those loonies. So it's a very easy transition for them as we start to move into the numbers. And we started with a two digit number and then show me the single digit. And then we, we added them together. So we do the physical part first, and then we do this, the sort of traditional algorithm part that goes along with it. We then do use Cuisinair rods, do exactly the same thing with Cuisinair rods because you have an orange that's a 10. Right, so I can use that same scenario so that they understand it's not just a base 10 block that I can do regrouping in. It's not just money that I do regrouping in. They have to be able to see it in a number of different places. So this is one way to do that. So place value visually, when you click this on, you'll have access to this too and you're welcome to use it. And it's taking forever to load, wow. So this is this is kind of that seeing is believing. This is where where we actually started with grade twos. So because I only kind of parachute into a class every once once every two weeks or once every ten days, um, I just need to make sure that you know we're not jumping ahead or that we're that they're actually ready for what we're going to do. So starting off with, I usually just say, show me show me these numbers. Like write them down on your whiteboard, the little whiteboards that they have in front of them. Show me the number two. Write me the number six, write me the number nine, right? I need them to know, first of all, that they even know the numbers. And that's a good test for us because they have to be able to get to a thousand. So we might as well make sure that they're all knowing what those, those values are. Can you show me 12, 25? These are just examples. Um, show me a triple digit number, right? In, in this group that they're working on, they're working at 600. There's very few that have gone beyond that. So 100, 120, 156. Remember, we don't say 100 and. 20 because that would be a decimal so the and means the decimal so we just say 120 156 205 yada 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 so 
whatever number your students are working at, then you could call out some random numbers. Let's just make sure that they know what those numbers are, because if I want them to show me that amount of money, then I need to know that they actually know what those numbers are too. Um, and then they can only use the $1, the $10, and the $100 bills, right? How could they show me any of those numbers? And I wouldn't have them all, but we started small. How could you show me six, right? They'd say, well, I could use a $5 bill and a one. They'd say, but we don't have a $5 bill. We're using a base 10 system of the ones, tens, hundreds. So how could you show me $6? So the only option would be for six loonies. So just getting them to slowly think that through because then when I ask them to lay out those show me the numbers, then it works from there. So we did examples such as this where I dragged out this number of loonies, ask them, you know, how would you, what would you do with this? And they said, well, you could take five of these and trade them for a $5 bill. You could take five of those and trade them for a $5 bill. Yep. And then what would happen? Well, you'd have, you could trade the two fives for a 10 and you still have two, two loonies left over. So that's the kind of work that we started with. We're not gonna use the fives right now, we're gonna to stick to tens. So in this case, I ask them to show me what does 46 look like? So four tens, six loonies, show me $22. So they have to show me that. And then, and usually we have them work together so you don't run out of loonies and tens. Um, and then how much money do you have together? So they know that they can slide all of the tens together. And when we say that tens go together in the tens column, this makes sense to them now because they see that the tens all look the same. They're all purple. So all the purples have to go together. It's not purple and green or purple and brown, it's purples. So when I say putting them all together, they understand what that means is that all the bills that look the same have to go together. And at the end, I'm going to double check to see whether or not I could make a trade. Now, they, I have this off to the side. They said, well, you could have traded five of the tens for a $50 bill and had that in your pocket. Yep, sure, I absolutely could have. And then I wouldn't have to walk around with six $10 bills. I'd only have one and a $50 bill. But again, we're just dealing with a $10, uh, 10 base 10 system. But that's the kind of conversation that we're at very quickly right now. So there's where money is, is the real world piece of it, right? It's that financial literacy piece I need to have that conversation. But it's the counter. It's This is the manipulative that I'm using money for right now is to get to the understanding of addition and place value. So working on that mastery to 100 is absolutely critical. Like the students really, really need to make sure that they are understanding that. And I can make this a little bit larger here. So if I showed them this, okay, I prepared that already as a slide. It came up on the, on the whiteboard. And then the question underneath would be, what number is this? So they can count up the tens, they can count up the ones, and they can tell me that it's $36. What number is in the tens place? Well, I can see it. I wrote three, six, but I can also see the tens column. So three is in the tens place. How many tens in the number? Well, that's really important for me to see because I need to know that three is in the tens place, but how many tens does that really mean? In money-wise, it means I have three $10 bills. That's what it's saying. How many ones in the number? So if they quickly say six, then we have an opportunity to say, I want you to think about the question again. It says, how many ones in the number? Not what is in the one's place? Six is in the one's place. That's absolutely correct. But if I said to you, let me rephrase my question. If I could only get paid in loonies, and how much is a loonie worth? One. Okay, so how many ones are in the number 36? If that's all you could pay me with, how many loonies would you have to give me? Oh, 36. That's the place value question. That's where we usually lose students. That's where we lose them on pad exams, dip exams. They, they, they don't get the difference between column position and value. So those are important questions to ask at all grade levels, like right off the bat, what does that mean? And for the first couple, of course, we're going to help them out with that. But eventually when I ask how many ones in there, I don't want to be saying to them, I want to remind you, I only want to pay you with loonies, right? I want them to understand what that question is asking them. 
So the same thing's happening on the other side. What number is it? So in this case, they can count it up. It's 63. What number is in the tens place? I wrote 63. 10 is tens, or six is in the tens column or in the tens place. How many tens the number? I can see them. I can count them. Should match. Should be six of them. So now if they understood our first round, how many ones in this number, then I might say 63. If they get it wrong again, I might rephrase it and say, how many ones in the ones place? Three. How many ones in the number, right? Just revisit it again and see if they can figure out, oh, oh, you know, you've asked that question again. So I have to remember about place and in the number is a different question. So then we could move a little bit further, especially now that they're moving into numbers of a thousand, There's, they've already skipped counted by tens in grade one, and now they're working on twenties, twenty fives, and fifties. So you might say, how many tens in a $50 bill? So they could count them out if they don't know. Some will just say five, but most students will count them out and show them to you and that's fine. So then the next question might be, how many tens in a $100 bill? So we would hope that some of the students, and some of them did for sure, say, well, there's two 50s and 100, and if there was five here, then there would be 10 here. Yeah, there will be students who recount again by tens to get to 100 and then count them and say there's 10 of them. Okay, and that's good formative info for me. That's my flag up that they didn't A, make that connection, but B, they're still, they're still having to count to count the number of bills to get to 100, which is 10 of them. So they're not as far along as I think they might be. So if they just recounted them, I might ask the question, is there another way that you could have come up with that answer of 10 $10 bills? Just to see if they come back to, well, you had five here and 250s is 100 because they are supposed to be able to skip count by 50. So making that connection for them. So then we wanna see, let's just keep going, then how many tens would be in $150? So again, if they've made the connection up top, they will already say that there's 15, 10 and five. And I would ask them, how do you know there's 15? Well, because there was five here and 10 here. Good, that's what I'm looking for. Not just give me a number. Um, what was your thinking behind it? So then if I really want to just double check to see if they've got it, then I might ask how many in $120. So now I've changed the condition. I know that you should have been exposed to 100 already. Let's see if you can figure out what you're going to do with the 20 to get an answer of 12. And you could throw in the question here, how many ones in there? Right, just, just ask them, how many ones? It's now $120. So they could write it out. Some students will say there's no ones in there because there's a zero in that column. So there's our FYI assessment again, that they're not understanding what's happening here and what the question is asking. So we would revisit that. So that mastery of 100 is really important. If I can master getting those numbers of the double digits well entrenched and just being able to move back and forth with them, add those numbers together. When I move into the hundreds, then I can start to assume that the addition of the tens and the ones is now pretty much set. And the whole process of adding another hundred bill into this is just another addition of a bill. So they actually handle this quite well, but if they don't nail this hundreds, just the basic idea of getting to a hundred, they're gonna struggle all the way through. So in this case, what's my number? What number is in the tens position? So two. So now comes the question, how many tens in the number? So again, they might say two, and we might say, let's go back to our first question. What number was in the tens place? Two. So how is this question different? It's asking you how many tens in the number? Or how many $10 bills would you have to give me for $124? Oh, right. So there's that connection of why we had them figure out how many tens in 100. I need to know that they know that because if I'm going to regroup and they have to borrow from the hundreds, I need them to understand what they're borrowing. They're borrowing 10 tens. We often say that to students, we're going to cross this number off and we're going to add one in the tens column because we're adding 10 tens in there. 
if they don't actually see what that is, that doesn't always register. It's a process without question, but that doesn't mean they understood it and, and can explain it. Um, if you absolutely want columns, go ahead and put columns on. I would still just use the, the headers to be the, the money values so that they're connecting those two together. You can still ask all the place value questions that you want. You can still ask them to regroup and add and do all those things. So once they're really, really good at adding, then we can do some very simple questions where they have to borrow from the 10 first, right? Change it to 10 loonies and put it up here. And that's where having that money app is great because then I can pull one of those $10 bills out, put 10 loonies up there, and then slide them all into my new grouping in here so that I can take away what I need to take away. It just makes it much more real. I'm not saying don't use base 10 blocks. Absolutely, please do use them because they're important. But this, I walk around with my pocket. And if I understand why I'm grouping and regrouping things, then when I get abstract to a little block and a rod and a flat, which I'm not going to walk around with in my pocket, and I have really no connection to other than it's a mathematical tool, which it is, um, then I have a connection. And if I get stuck, the, little, the kids will say right away, that little square, that's our loony. I said, yep, you're right. That's your loony. And so what does that make the rod? That's our $10 bill. So they just go back and forth. And that makes it just a little bit easier for some of our students who struggle if they need something that's a little bit more realistic for them to, to work from. Okay, so let's move on from there. So combining uh, place value questions with the value, right? That's important. What position is the number in and what's the value? So we want to start that fairly quickly on so that students are connecting those pieces because if you want me to regroup, then I need to better understand some of those pieces as well. Um, we'll talk about the number game in just a second. The kids called it a numbers game, but we'll, I'll show you what that is. You can remember that they're supposed to be skip counting by 20s, 25s, 50s. So we can be using the money, the $20 bills, the quarters, the 50 cent pieces, the $50. All of those are great ways for them to practice and that they can actually get into the higher numbers, especially skip counting by 50s. So that gives me an opportunity to actually put the money in front of them, but also have them do the number outcome that we're trying to get them to. And then uh, when we talk about determine the value of a collection of coins or bills of the same denomination by skip counting, right? So that's the same thing, skip counting by 50s or 20s or $10 bills or quarters or nickels or whatever you're going to have them do. We're not necessarily mixing and matching, although there's nothing wrong with a student who says, I can tell you exactly how much money I have in front of you. And they count it all out, dollars and cents. That's excellent. That's great. That's, that's really where we'd love them to be. Okay, the other piece is that we're talking about odds and evens. And so how do I describe an odd and even? So that's your introduction into fractions in grade two. So in kindergarten, in the fraction conversation, they talk about sharing. So we might take coins, dump them, all the same ones, have them sort them into the groups of the like coins, and then just say, I would like you to share those coins that each one of us, you and I, get the same amount of each of the coins. So if I have a pile of pennies, you get one, I get one, you get one, I get one, that kind of thing. If I have a leftover, we'll just leave them to the side and we can talk about the leftovers, right? But it's an equal share at that point. Nobody got one more or less than the other and then you move on to the next coin. In grade one, we would revisit that just with higher denominations, all of the denominations. And then they talk about the word halves. So in theory, the students would have landed at your doorstep this year, having good knowledge of what is a half and not as a one over two, right? It's not, there's no symbolic written any one over two language in grade one. It's all about the words, the, the pictures. Um, can they find halves in the classroom? Could they see something and show you what the other half would be, right? So this is where symmetry in grade one played a really big role because when we talk about the word halves, I have that line of symmetry that runs through the middle to create two equal pieces. So there's my halves in pictures. So the same thing would happen now that you're gonna move into grade two transformations. I can have that reflection is the other half um, or 
or if it's not a half, like if you haven't used a line of symmetry, then I see two equal pieces. So if I had to share them out, you would get one piece, I would get the other one, and we would both have the same amount. But that's where you're going to start with the fraction conversation. In grade two, they also talk about quarters. So they talk about the word quarters. I have a coin called a quarter. What did it mean? Well, I needed four of them, four pieces, four one quarter pieces gave me my loony. So you are eventually at the end of grade two going to introduce the one over four, the one over two, but that is like way down at the end of grade two. It's not a rush to get there because the whole point of, of the work here is for them to understand the relationships that are being described. What does it mean to have half a sandwich? What's the relationship of what I'm eating to where I got it from, right? So can they describe that in words, find you pictures, walk down the hallway and say, say I see quarters or I see halves or I see those, right? That's where you wanna start. So an introduction into odds and evens, sharing. If I can share and you and I get exactly the same amount, there was no leftovers, then we have an even number. But if I have leftovers, then for sure, I have an odd number. And that's a good starting point for that conversation. So you're looking at words, words, and words, like just words and understanding. That's really where you want to start. And part of that comes from the reason, I, well, part of the reason I think we're seeing fractions start earlier is, is twofold. One of them is that students are not doing well in fractions and the research that is quite extensive and still ongoing right now, and I've mentioned it once before, but but the research is showing that students, when they don't get fractions in the early years, they don't pick it up. It's not one of those ones that as time grows, as I get older, as I get to Div 2 or Div 3, I pick it up. They don't pick it up. They don't get it. If they don't get it right off the bat, that there's a relationship between those numbers, they don't get it. And they say it just basically goes right into the work world. So there are people that deal with fractions on a day-by-day -day basis um, and they cannot maneuver the understanding of the fraction that they're having to deal with in that particular job. I had that happen. I was in nursing before I was in teaching and I had a partner. And, and often when you're drawing up meds, you're not drawing up everything that's in a vial or you're not using all of a pill. So you have to know the proportions that you're gonna set up and proportions are set on fractions. And for Lovner Money, she struggled with the notion that, you know, she needed to have it in a proportion of one to five. What does that look like? And it was always the question is, how am I going to make this, draw this up to make it one to five? Um, you know, what does that look like? How much water do I have to put into this? And that is the legitimate results of, of what we're seeing from the study is that there are people that struggle. It doesn't mean she wasn't a great nurse. She was a fantastic nurse and she would never have given anything to anyone without double checking. But it really gave a lot of, made me think after I read the research for, for fractions, um, that this is very real, that people are not picking it up as they get into high school, oh, they'll learn it there. No, they don't learn it there. They miss it, they miss it. It tends to not get picked up now. There would be exceptions to the rule. But fractions are excellent predictors of academic success, not academic success in fractions, academic success, period. So students who understand relationships between numbers understand that the notion of, of what a fraction is all about will academically tend to do better than students who don't. They, it just seems to go through a number of the different strands of understanding that students have. We know that we need them for measurement. We know we need them for probability. We know we need them for algebra. So all of those are places where fractions are embedded big time. And we don't go through anything in our day-to-day -day routine where there isn't something to do with proportional reasoning. If you went and got a coffee this morning and you asked for two cream and one sugar, you asked for proportion for your coffee. That's exactly what that was. This is your ratio of what you want to mix your coffee that it tastes right for you. So we deal with proportions every day without even thinking of them. But that's what, what fractions build on, is, is they build on that, that proportional thinking that we, we get. So what are some of the challenges that have occurred? 
in fractions alone, some of the most common fract or challenges that students exhibit is that they don't get that when you write one over two, they just assume, or we assume sometimes that when I give them the example, I'm gonna take a cookie and break it in half, and I'm gonna give one half to Nicole and I'm gonna get the other half. And that means that each one of us got one of two equal pieces, one of the whole, the whole was the whole cookie, but we broke it into two. That that's an intuitive, that they've got that. Yep, that makes sense, one out of two. They might write one out of two, but that doesn't necessarily mean they understand conceptually what you've just said to them. And that's basically what the research says. Students who don't get it may get all the right answers. They might color in all the right things, but they're not understanding what they're actually coloring in. And so in the end, when we start to ask them more questions that are a little bit deeper into that, they're still the kids who are seeing one over two as two whole numbers. And so when you ask them the question, which is larger, one half or one third, they'll go one third because three is further on the number line to the right than two is. And so they're still thinking whole numbers. So that's what the research basically has shown so far is that so many students can't get that relationship piece happening. They also don't understand that fractions are numbers. In the interview with students, and these were even junior high students that they talked to and senior high students as well, they said, what are fractions? Well, they're those, like they're, they're the like one over something or two over something. Yeah, but what are they? Well, they're like fractions. You know, you, you can cut something up or you can color it in, but they could for very few situations to tell you that a fraction was a number. They had no idea that they actually were numbers. They knew how to do them, they knew what to color, they knew how to break it up, they knew how to, but they could not articulate that they were actual numbers. And part of that comes from the fact that we teach students in grades, kindergarten, grade one, grade two, grade three counting. We teach you how to count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We teach you how to skip count two, four, six, eight. But we don't, we seldom say, okay, today we're going to skip count by one tenth. We're going to take the unit fraction. We're, we're going to count on a number line by one tenth. Why wouldn't we? Those are dimes. My first dime, my second dime, my third dime, my fourth dime, my fifth dime. So this is part of what you're seeing now too, is the resurgence of the unit fraction, that one over a number. It's a huge component in the grade three curriculum, but it starts in grade two. And so it's important that they understand that. The other thing that comes out of it, I won't read through all of this, is that North American teachers, that was interesting. Uh, so US and Canada in particular got nailed on this one is that we have a fetish about circles. We go to circles, cookies and pizzas, and we do, it's true. Yep, Nicole, but in grade two, they need to go up to tenths. That's right, they do. And so we could use dimes. Dimes could be tenths, right? They can go one tenth. This is my second one tenth jump, my third one tenth. They could be one half. So that's where that symbolic is going to come in towards the latter part of the year until they understand what all of that language means. You don't need to jump into the number parts right away. But yeah, they do. They, they're going to go to denominators of tens for sure. And so what their, their suggestion is that in order to get, let's say, to those tens and the different numbers is don't use circles. And that's true. It, it really, because when you think about it, I can take a circle on paper and fold it in half. I can fold it in quarters very easily. But if I said to any one of you on the screen right now, I'd like you to draw me a perfect one third. Most of you, unless you know a lot about the paper folding, most of you would say, if you give me a protractor, I will draw you a perfect one third. I will make an angle of 120 and then I'll divide it up into three pieces, right? So it's not an intuitive shape to come up with all those different shapes that we need or values that we need. So what the suggestion is, is they're not saying don't use circles. They're just saying be extremely intentional when you wanna talk about pizzas and cookies that you're only using it with things that they could actually maneuver on a paper if they had to. You better would be using a rectangle because rectangles, I can fold them and fold them and fold them. Um, squares, um, hexagons, octagons, things where I can fold them over in a number of different ways to see what the different pieces look like. So again, it's just that opportunity for us to think about 
if we revisit some of these, what could it look like in a revisit? There's lots of really good virtuals right now that you can use where it allows you to, to take a rectangle, for example, and divide it into whatever sizes you want. So if you wanted the odd number of seven, not that that's a significant fraction of anything in the world, um, you can do it, right? And then they can, they can see how it looks. You can also show a student how to fold a rectangle into sevens. Um, not just always an even number. They just need to be taught how to do that. And you can take any piece of paper and fold it into any number. You just need the rules to, to figure that out. So what they're saying is maybe stay away from the number piece to start with and just work on the word relationship. How are, how's this number related? How's my half of the cookie related to um, the part that Nicole got and the part that we got it from, right? Just having that conversation, cutting a sandwich in half. Um, doing those types of pieces. So even a picture like this, right, where they're seeing um, what are the examples that I see of halves? What are the examples that I see of quarters? So if they know that this is a half note, right, if they are a musical student, some students see this as a glass half full. Some of them see it as a glass half empty. Great conversation to have, right? But those are the just, that's the starting point where they they really need to be able to see that in the world before we worry about the number part of it. And then all the different places that we can do the, the wording. So yes, you're gonna to get to the number parts for sure. Just maybe not right up front. In the math kits, um, a number of you have templates at your schools where you can do cutting out um, like cardboard letters to put them up on your display walls. I cut these ones out. I just bought a bunch of foam at Dollar Tree and and just put them underneath and just cut them out because you've got all these different shapes and letters. And some letters are great to do that with too. But in this case, I could do that. I, I could have them fold them. And when they're in foam, it pops back again. Paper is great, but it's also limited because I, once I've got the crease on there, it's kind of obvious every time it's going to be the same thing. So having them maybe just on foam, these are the sheets that I just got and then just using those types of things to cut them out. What else could you use that's in the classroom? Like everybody has different things in their classroom. What do you have that reflects halves and quarters? Um, pattern blocks, get those out because those would be great for, for doing those pieces as well. Um, doing your, you know, your one quarters, your one halves, your one fifths, your one sixth. Like you can do all kinds of things with your pattern blocks. Dumping the money, right? And having them put them into groups and then putting them in groups of fives, five loonies. So one of those loonies will be one fifth of the total that's there. So I can build any size that I need, maybe just staying away from just always a circle where they have these odd sections divided into 11. And we say, can you find one 11th and shade it in? Yep, I can get 100 on that sheet and know nothing about a unit fraction. So I just learned that you just have to tell me that you want how many to count how many are in there. And I just have to shade in one or maybe two, like whatever you want me to do. So it's just giving them that opportunity to have that conversation first. Okay, oops. We also want to at the bottom here when it talks about um, looking at quantities, having benchmarks. So if I'm looking at a thousand, if you're not gonna use, let's say the adding tape measure and, and unfolding that down the hallway and let's say having a zero to a thousand and some benchmarks in between, like maybe you put a hundred on there, 500 on there, 750 on there, whatever. And then you can just give students a number, just randomly give them a number. And so if I'm a student who's working on only to 200, then you're going to differentiate and give me the number, I don't know, whatever, 174. I get it on a card, little um, clothes peg, and I'm going to go put it on that number line where I think it is approximately right, right? And there's going to be some variation. But obviously, if I put 174 right beside 200, that's not a reasonable estimate. Um, if Marina is able to handle 600s already, I might give her a number just slightly over 600. Maybe I'm going to push her a little bit and say, you know, here's your number, six, 623. Go find where you might put that. So having that conversation and giving them, you could do it with string. Just take a big ball of string and put it down the hallway and have some markers, big cards on it. Say, here's, here's uh, zero, here's 500, 200, whatever you want to put on there. And then can they go find their number and put it approximately on the number line? Again, that's just getting to the thousand. It's investigating. And it also gives you formative information about what they know about the positions of those numbers based on sort of the benchmarks that you've given them. Um, there's a couple of sessions or sections in here. One of them K5. I'm going to throw this one in the chat box. 
And if you have not bookmarked this site, I'm going to suggest to you that you do that, not because of just this worksheet that's on here. I'm not a worksheet advocate. I'll throw it in the chat box if you want to grab it. K5 Learning is a site that you can get 95% of your formatives. If you want to do a quick assessment of where kids are at, that's what I use that for, not so much worksheet. I'm not, I'm not into the, let's just do numbers and fill them in. But there's lots of great things in here that are done for you. And they're, they're done well. And that's the one thing I have to say. And they're free. That's the other piece. So if you can just look on the screen for a second, you might be downloading, but just so that you're aware of, of how this works. It is a subscription one. You can go in and subscribe anyway for free. But you don't have to buy anything at all. Anything that's on a sheet like this. So I've given you one that is benchmarking and that they can use estimates to, to figure out measurement. Anything that's in a green on the side is a free worksheet. So you can click those on, download them. There's no royalties. You're not breaking any copyrights. You can photocopy them, use them as much as you want. Sometimes they have five, six, seven green ones beside each one. And some sometimes below the greens are a purple one. And the purple ones, may be free, you can click them on, or they'll say subscription only, but some of them are free. There's more here than you would ever need. But what I wanted to say was, if you look at grade two, and remember our grade two might be their grade two, grade three, so go to grade three as well. Um, you have all of these different areas that work for us, for our outcomes, because everything's outcome-based. This is a fantastic site for you to go to. So especially if I want to differentiate because I've got a pod of children who are just not where everybody else is. And then I've got this group over here that are high flyers. And I really want to assess where both of them are at or all three groups are at. I could go here and find really timely formative kinds of questions, maybe just six on a page. That's all you need. Quick touch base to see where are they at. So it just gives you some places to go. They do have resources on here, like their entire um, units are in workbooks. I did order one of their workbooks over the summer. I just wanted to see what it was like. It really is just taking what they're showing you here to a, a, a bigger step and a bigger level. So I'm not suggesting that you buy those because there's more on here than you could possibly need. You would not use the money in here because this is not a Canadian based one, but it's an outcome based one. Um, and it works exceptionally well for everything that we do. So bookmark that one, share it with your colleagues at school because it, it goes up to grade five, um, which would be our grade four right now because a lot of that's been downloaded. You're also working on symbols of greater than, less than, having that kind of an activity, that would be a, an important piece. Uh, we're talking about visualizing 100 in compositions, right? So that goes back to that money that I showed you in compositions of $10 bills, 10 loonies, 10 hundreds, right? So having that kind of work, and definitely I would want to bring in base 10 blocks at some point, but only after they're really proficient at the money. Um, the Cuisinier rods, another one. Again, you could link this one on that gives you some possibilities for counting. But again, you don't need to go here for worksheets, right? It's more the hands-on pieces that we're looking for for the students. Um, place value, we talked about that already for regrouping and, and adding. So that just builds entirely on our 2.2. 2. So determining the missing quantity. So you might even say, show me $34. So they show you $34. And then below that, you might say, show me, and just start small, $31. So they show you 31. What would you need to add to my 31? So there's my missing amount to make the 34, right? Really simple question. And then you could add it so that they have to add a, a significantly larger number to that. So just doing those types of things with them is an easy piece for them to do when they're managing the money. OK, let's move to measurement very quickly. So measurement is just looking at quantitative or qualitative. Like this thing is too big. Comparative language would be the qualitative piece, too big, too small, too heavy, light, like that kind of language versus actual weighing, measuring with a ruler which is the quantitative amount. And I've taken some slides here from Marion Small's work. She has a great book out, and I'll show that book to you at the end here. If you're looking for something for you, not for the students, but something just 
timeless, to be honest with you, that hits every strand and almost anything that we teach. Uh, she has a great book for that. So it's just some of the things that students do when it comes to measurement. Um, they're not always astute to attributes. We sometimes spend time looking at different colors. So they could see that one is yellow, one is green, or one is bigger, one is smaller. That's true. But are they also in tune that this one might likely, the green one, be heavier because it has a significantly thicker rim on it. So there's more product in it, Okay, of course, depending on what it was made of. But, but just having that conversation with them is what else do we see in the picture that might give us some information about how we describe the measurement of those two bowls. So one could be heavier than the other. Okay, familiarity with certain measures as reference. So do they know approximately how wide their finger is? And, and what on their desk might they use the width of their finger to measure? Um, and then you might ask them, you know, what do you think we could use to measure from the front of the room to the back? And they say, well, we could use our finger. Yeah, you could, you absolutely could, it's not wrong. Not likely that it's gonna work, but absolutely they could do that. And I would say, why don't you try it out and see how it works? And after about the 20th time they put their finger down, they say, this is gonna take forever. Okay, so then what do you think we could do? Well, we could use our shoe. Absolutely, so you could take your shoes. And again, even that might be too small, but it, that's that opportunity for them to pick a reference. And do they know anything about the reference? Do they know approximately how tall their body is or their shoe size? Like how much does that take? So just having that conversation, if you still have tiles in your school, you might see, you know, how long is a tile or a brick on the wall? If you have the large uh, bricks that are painted, you know, is a brick about the length of their finger to their elbow or, or what is it? So that they could even use that as a marker, just going for a walkabout in the school. Measuring principles, picking the right tool. So that's going back to what I was saying. If it's a picture of a car, would it be reasonable for me to say the car's picture is like 10 paper clips long? Yeah. Would it be reasonable for me to say I'm going to take the car outside and measure it in paper clips? Probably not, because they're just not going to be able to be accurate enough. Even at the best guess, it's just going to take them a long time. They're going to get tired of it and they're just going to give up. Um, and again, this is what this one talks about is choosing the right thing. Sometimes our feet, you get tired of being to go heel to toe, heel to toe. So even if you're going to do that across the room, kids will just give up. They'll just say, or the steps get bigger, right? It's no longer heel to toe, kind of bigger step, and then bigger step. Okay, I'm at the end, you know, and this is how far I got, except we kind of lost our reference as we went along. And they call that just measuring fatigue because we chose the wrong tool is really what it is. Some of the misconceptions as well, often students who don't have good spatial, and it's a good one to try out with the students in your class, is just put two lines down, even two pipe cleaners or something, but even showing them this picture, are these two lines the same length? And students who don't have good spatial sense will say no, right? That this one's way longer because if they can't see it, it must not be there. So then having the ability to pick it up and say, what do you think now? Oh yeah, they are the same length. So what do you think happened? Oh, it was getting covered up, but it was really there. It's the same thing as little children, right? When they cover their eyes, they think that once they covered their eyes and closed them, they're, they're, nobody sees them anymore. Or we don't see them anymore. Like it's just that peekaboo thing, same idea. And there are some students that goes well into school before they, they get that sort of sorted out. Um, they don't understand that pieces have to be aligned, right? Lots of students will say to you, the bottom one is longer. And you could use these actual pictures. Which one do you think is longer? bottom one. Why do you think that's true? Because it's further out. So when we're comparing heights in class and we say go back to back, what do we notice about when we go back to back? Do we have anybody who's standing up on a chair or are we both starting on the ground, like are we starting in the same place, right? So then we can have the reason or about conversation about bringing it back to a starting point. This is also a very common one and you'll find this even in junior high students who will, will not, just cannot spatially see this. Which line is longer? They'll say the green one because it's further out beyond everything. They have no concept that this is still distance and length just been compacted. So having, again, a piece of string or a pipe cleaner where you can pull that out and show them, you know, but I would ask the question first, what do you think? Which one is longer? 
and and see what your class says. If all of them say, oh, definitely the purple one, well, then we know we don't have that issue to worry about. But if there's a debate, well, then that's a good question for us to, to figure out. So problems with iterations would be that I chose a paper clip to measure the car. I chose my shoe, my hand, my finger to measure a really big distance. I get tired of it because I'm tired of putting it over and over and over again. And so I lose it. I become really inaccurate because I just get tired and I eventually just, just get me to the end. I don't care what it looks like. Another common one, and this is very common in, in grade twos that you will see them, is that they are so used to counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And this is the part about going and counting. Um, <coughs> excuse me, the difference between a number path. That's a number path, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. A number line has to have a zero on it because the zero distance to the one is there to tell us how big one unit will be on that tool that you're using to measure. That's the purpose of the distance from zero to one. It tells us the starting distance and that every one of these will look exactly the same as zero to one. That's what a ruler is. And so students often think because I started counting at one, when I measure something that I just start at one as well, they forget that this is the first distance to one. When we measure, it's a distance that we're looking for, not a quantity of number like total there. This is a common one too. When it goes past a number, a whole number on a ruler, the answer is usually a half. It doesn't have to be a half. It could be short of a half, long, longer than a half, but students will just say, oh, it's seven and a half. Right? They fail to take the time to actually realize that these numbers align to smaller values. And this would be true even of older students. So one of the activities that you might wanna do right now, and I've uploaded these into the folder for you so that you can grab them. Um, this is just an open number line where you could, depending on where your students are at, if you have students that are all soaring above 100, then you would wanna grab numbers that go to you know, 100, 200, 300, 400. You've got all the way to 1,000 in groups of 100. Um, but what we did here is we, let's just start small. So let's say that you wanted to go to 50 or just to 10. Like maybe I've still got some students who are just struggling. Um, and so what we did is we cut these numbers apart and just put them into small bags. So they didn't take long at all. And then what the students do is they lay them out in front of them and they just grab one. So let's say I gave you from the bag of 11 to 20. So they put them face down in front of them. They grab one number and uh, they put it onto the number line. So first of all, I'm just checking to see whether they can even count to 20 and get it in the right place. Uh, or I'm gonna have them grab two and I'm gonna go for numbers that are in between. So you might use this sheet instead. So if I'm working to a thousand right now and I wanna know where students are at, so maybe I'm only in the 401 to 500 group, I turn two number cards over the, the smallest one goes in here. And the largest one, if I can count out, I'll put it on the line. If it's way past, in other words, let's say I grabbed 402 and um, 389. Well, I'm not going to have enough tick marks. They simply put 389 at the very end. And then they ask questions, answer questions at the top, like, what's the number that came before the one they put in the box? So without looking at a number line, can they tell you what came before 402? What's the number that came right after the number that was in the box? So what came after 402? What's two after 402? And then can you give me any three numbers between this one and whatever your other number was? So this is what the cards look like. You just cut them up. And then we also use them by having the kids come and draw if they were gonna do them on the string with the pegs and things like that, that's another option that you have to do. So here's an example where they turned over 56 and 67. So I could put those on, on the number line. Here's 56, here's 67. What's my number before? What's my number after? Then I can do that comparative because you're using less than, greater than already. I can talk about it. I can use comparative language, which one is less than, which is smaller. How do I know it's smaller? How do you, can you, tell me, explain to me how you know that 109 is smaller than 121, and so on. And when you don't put the numbers back in, these sheets have five different lines on them. 
if we just give the, the students their own little bag, um, then we tell them just leave them on there. They don't, you don't have to, we actually laminated them and, and the kids use dry erase markers, so then you can just keep using them. But when they put the cards on, if they leave them there, then there's no chance of them coming back with the same ones. Oh, I got the same ones again. Oh, I got the same ones again. No, you can't use the same ones. So you just leave them. This is the number line that's in the kit. So there is a suggestion of how we would create and what would what might be on the thousand number line. Um, these are the, the way I sort of sorted my numbers in that 1000 piece. I did them by hundreds so that I could pick and choose when I have to do different groups of students based on what they're at. You also have the cards in there to show the transformations. Those are in there as well. Yeah, no worries. So let's look at geometry very quickly because you are gonna be doing transformations. So it's important that they're able to classify certain shapes. They know their triangles and they would know them by now. Their triangles, their squares, their hexagons, pentagons. So using your base 10 block, or sorry, your pattern blocks would be a good place. If you have the Desi blocks to go along with the pattern blocks, that just gives you a bigger choice of things that you can talk about with them. Um, but again, when we talk about a triangle, they just might know everything is a triangle, right? It's got three sides, it's called a triangle. If they happen to know that if it's got three sides that are the same length, like the little green ones are in your pattern blocks, then we can say to them, well, you know, for every side that's the same, then they're going to have that many angles the same. So if they know that a triangle has 180 degrees in it, it's half of a square, which is 360. Okay, they might know that, they might not. So it depends on how far they are. Hula hoops make great activities for Venn diagrams. So laying a hula hoop down on the floor and giving me a whole bunch of pattern blocks and, and giving me the rule of whatever you want me to do. So you've got an example here. Um, can they place the things into the, without, without you telling them what's gonna go in the middle here, right? They should be able to figure that piece out. But using hula hoops also gets them out of their chairs, gets them on the floor where they have to manipulate things and, and move them around. I can use my shapes to also enhance my pattern conversation. So I could have a very simple pattern. What do I see? I see a rectangle, triangle, triangle, or square, square, triangle, triangle, whichever. Um, and it's a simple pattern. But now when I look down here, I see a rectangle, a slant, a trapezoid, a slant and rectangle, back to the vertical slant. So it's two different things happening. It's vertical slant, vertical slant, vertical slant, and then I have the different repetitions of the shapes. So can they see both of those patterns, right? Can they identify them? Increasing patterns, you talk about that. You could use the squares and the pattern blocks. That's another one. You could use the hexagons and put one, put three, and then just build it that way. But there's lots of different possibilities for patterns. There's lots of free ones that you can even show on, on from the download from the internet as well. The sheet that I'm showing you now is one, and I'm, we've gone over here, and I'm gonna, just going to wrap it up here quickly. This is just a scope and sequence. This is not your year at a glance or anything like that. But some people were just saying, could we just quickly see what we're doing in geometry, just in geometry? Um, what does that look like going all the way across the grades? And we maintain the same thing that yellow highlights uh, is new to that grade. So that you can kind of see that as you're going further to the right, it's a lot of yellow. There's a lot of new things happening there, but it gives you a sense of how things kind of fit together. This has also been uploaded, um, or sorry, it's not uploaded, but this is an activity. It goes much the same as what we were just talked about with the two hula hoops. So you might want to give them something like this as an example, but I also gave you a blank one in there that you can use. So you can type in whatever you want and then they would get whatever tools, maybe you give some group spares, some pattern blocks, some cleats and air rods, whatever, so that they all see something different. And then you have your transformations. So this card is also in your kit, but I've given you some places that you can go to here. Math is fun. Gives you just a, a visual of what these look like. And if you scroll down a little bit further, you'll have lots of different choices that you can go to as well. So this is just a great little place for you to grab some of the um, additional visuals that you might not have right now because we don't have the same resources for everyone. There's an investigate definition here. 
because some people were asking, what does it really mean to investigate? So this is one of your def definitions that we've already created in the math dictionary that's coming out. So that will be available for you as well. Some of you have this book in your school, you might not be aware of it, but it's an Oracle book, Mirror, Mirror. It's actually probably in the kindergarten classroom, but it's great for reflections. So if you have it, uh, I would grab it. It's a great big book, great conversation time to read a story to them. But now we can talk about, hey, you know, where do we see reflections in here? And where is this um, kangaroo going every time that he sees something? You could use letters. These are just from Dollar Tree. I went out and bought a whole bunch of letters or cut them out. Which letters are good reflections? Which ones can you fold in half and have a line of symmetry? What do they look like when you turn them over, right? For the rotations and for um, the slides. And then I've given you, you can link it on here, but I've given you a sample assessment. I did this one very early on in July. So you're welcome to use it. Don't have to use it. You can just cut and paste pieces of it. But it just takes the students through, is this a, is this a reflection, not a reflection? Is this a rotation? So there's a whole number of pages there that you can use as an assessment if you so choose. And everything that is on this page is really just a link for you for resources that links specifically to what we just talked about in measurement, in geometry, transformations, or the numbers to a thousand. I was trying to narrow it down to just those concepts that we're working on. This is the book of Marion Small. It's about a 600 page soft cover book, but it has everything in it, including student exemplars of work. Um, so you kind of get to see what a student typically at that age should be able to do and not do. So if, if you're looking for a resource for yourself, that might be one to look at. Okay, and then there, oops, there are some books that most of you have in your schools. I know St. Augustine has these. These are outcome-based, all game formats. So if you're wanting to revisit an outcome, bigger numbers, you could go grab from the fundamentals book and still hit your target, your outcomes, but in a game format. And these are open-ended questions that you can use. In this case, this is a book for K123. This is on number. There's one for geometry, one for patterning. And they are great questions because it just gets us away from the right or wrong answer. There's sometimes more than one possible answer for them. So it gives the kids that opportunity to critically think. All right, I apologize that we went over, but I know we had lots for this one to cover because it's kind of a big slide now from February. So feel free to reach out at any time if there's anything that I can help you with or send to you. Um, your file folder, remember, just go to the Moving Forward website. You'll find it, everything in there. It's already been posted. The recording will be up there probably tonight um, and everything will be ready to go. Thanks very much. Take care.